All right, and we are ready to get started. I want to welcome everyone to our Race Matters course. I think that we are in week nine, is that correct? I okay. think so. <laughs> We have had so many great weeks and just learning so much, and especially this week. Um, as you know, we will start with, actually today, our guest, um, Claire, will, will start by speaking for about 10 minutes. And then our second guest, we actually have two guests today, um, Jermaine will share some. And then we will um, to put questions in the Q&A. We may not get to them all but um, we will post this video and make it available on YouTube, on our YouTube channel tomorrow. And let's see, I want to just share a great opportunity that we have at LR that connects to the themes in our course. Um, there will be a racial reconciliation where you live panel next Monday, March 28th, and on LR's Hickory campus um, at the Grace Chapel. And that will start at 7 p.m. It's free and open to the public. And actually, um, one of our previous guests, who you might remember, Miss Honey Estrada, will be a part of that panel. And she was such a dynamic voice um, when we got to learn from her a few weeks ago. So if you're able, please make it a point to come on out Monday, March 28th, 7 p.m. in Grace Chapel. That's all for announcements, right? I, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's introduce our, our guest. I'll turn it over to Taylor. Yeah, uh, so as Dr. Carol mentioned, we have three excellent guests here tonight, uh, including someone who should be familiar to you now, uh, Dr. Shaheen Tasharafi, uh, who joined the faculty recently. Um, so in the fall of 2020, uh, we were fortunate to have him come and join our faculty as an assistant professor of criminal justice. Uh, he earned his PhD in criminal justice from the University of Cincinnati. And I think we got you straight from grad school. Is that right? something like that. Awesome. Uh, so he teaches uh, intro to criminology, intro to criminal justice, research methods, statistics, juvenile delinquency and corrections at the undergraduate and criminal justice policy at the graduate level. Um, Dr. Tasharafi's uh, research interests include developmental criminology, health criminology, juvenile corrections, all centered around work providing evidence-based policy decisions. His research seeks to identify how environmental factors early in life impact criminological phenomenon later on and how the juvenile justice system could address the needs of justice involved youth through effective uh, preventative and rehabilitative approaches and I think that passion came through his lecture really nicely it was uh, nice to see a, a, a little bit of uh, your own personal kind of research as it intersects with the topics of this class um, and Dr. Tasha Rafi uh, also has firsthand experience working with serious juvenile offenders. Um, and I don't think that these two facts are related, that he has firsthand experience working with serious juvenile offenders. And outside of the university, he coaches soccer at the Catawba Valley uh, Youth Soccer Association. So those two things aren't related, right? <laughs> They're not very related. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Dr. Carroll is going to introduce our other two guests, Dr. Strange and Mr. Archer. Yes, thanks, Dr. Newton. So Dr. Claire Strange is a postdoctoral scholar for the Criminal Justice Research Center. In this role, she works on projects of interest to the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing, Sentencing with a particular focus on racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system. Additionally, Dr. Strange implements her own research agenda independently and through collaborations with the Criminal Justice Research Center and faculty members from the Department of Sociology and Criminology. Dr. Strange received her MSW from the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College and her PhD from the University of Cincinnati School of Criminal Justice. She recently completed a doctoral fellowship under Sheetal Renjan um, of William Patterson University, where she was evaluating Jersey Shore University Medical Center's first hospital-based violence intervention program. So drawing upon her early career experiences as a re-entry social worker, Dr. Strange scholarly interests center on sentencing and corrections and include the drivers of criminal justice actor decision-making and their implications for punishment and treatment outcomes, 
as well as the justice process and treatment experiences and their contributions to recidivism and health outcomes. And three, developing and disseminating and evaluating evidence-based correctional tools. At its core, Dr. Strange's research aims to uncover and address the mechanisms that hinder the impartial or effective nature of punishment or treatment interventions with current or formerly justice-involved people. Through her research endeavors, Dr. Strange has experienced designing and conducting quantitative analyses using large administrative data sets and qualitative analyses using interview and focus group data. You have been very, very busy. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr. Strange. And now we have Mr. Jermaine Archer to introduce. He is a Brooklyn native and the seventh of 12 siblings. While he admits to engaging in a reckless and dangerous past, he was incarcerated for a murder he did not commit and released in 2020. In prison, he searched himself and not liking the individual he encountered, he decided to rise above his circumstance and be the best Germain he could be by focusing on his passions, languages, education, and young people. Today, he speaks, reads, and writes Spanish and French, and he's currently studying German. Wow. Um, he co-created the first and only Chinese Mandarin language course to be taught inside a New York State prison. His many educational and therapeutic accomplishments include earning his bachelor's in science from Hudson Link Mercy College and his master in professional studies from New York Theological Seminary. As an advisor to the Osborne Association's Children with Incarcerated Parents Initiative and a member of the Youth Assistance Program, which allows incarcerated men to share their life experiences with community youth to help them make better decisions, Jermaine continues his life's mission of aiding young people. Along these lines, Jermaine co-founded co Forgotten Voices, Voices from Within, a group of men who decided to redefine what it means to repay a debt to society. To date, this organization has raised approximately $8,000 in prisoner donated funds to sponsor a community gun buyback. Jermaine has worked with NBC Dateline producer Dan Slepian to produce a short film aimed at reducing youth gun violence. And he was also the MC for a TEDx event held at Sing Sing State Prison, um, which is about an hour north of New York City. Now that's a lot right there, but what, um, what Jermaine is most proud of is his status as just a good son, a good husband, a brother, an uncle, a father, and a stepfather. Welcome, Mr. Archer. Thank you. Oh, and so now I have more. I still have things that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so I think we're going to start with you, Dr. Strange, and you're going to open up and just share a little bit about the work you're doing, correct? Yeah. Sure. So hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't know if it's immediately known to the audience, but there's a connection between all three of us as presenters today. I guess that connection's me. <laughs> but um, I got my PhD from Cincinnati with Dr. Tasha Rafi, so that's how we know each other. And then I met uh, Mr. Archer in Sing Sing Correctional Facility when I was getting my master's degree and I was interning for the college uh, the program that funds college education inside uh, the the prison, and so I I met him there, um, and it was a, an arts program that I was helping teach. And uh, I wish I had video evidence of this, but Jermaine actually performed Anna Kendrick's Cups performance with red solo cups. <laughs> Do you remember that, Jermaine? <laughs> so anyway, uh, there's a a history between all of us. So, um, but I'll just briefly speak about a couple of the things that I'm working on now. So I, uh, my position is with Penn State University and the, the criminal justice research center that they have there. But my, my main role is to collaborate with the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing on their projects of interest. And they hired me because of my focus on race and ethnicity as it relates to courts, sentencing, corrections, rehabilitation. That's always been 
um, a research interest of mine. And so um, the projects that I work on are, are related to that. But uh, so for example, right now, um, we're working on a project that looks at the impacts of COVID-19 on case processing and sentencing um, as it relates to race and ethnicity. So obviously courts have uh, sort of a culture and they have a, a working group that efficiently works through lots of cases. And so when something comes through and disrupts that, like COVID, um, it's important to understand how those interruptions might impact uh, disparities that are linked to race and ethnicity. And so we also saw that with Hurricane Katrina as well. There's research on that. So, so that's one project. Um, another project is Pennsylvania is right in the middle of revising their sentencing guidelines. And this is the first time in probably over 10 years that they are having a complete overhaul. And part of the purpose of that is to reduce disparities that are linked to prior record as it factors into sentences. And so that um, sort of determining that uh, the impacts of prior record on sentencing and what have you and, and how changes might um, impact, you know, worsen or uh, lessen disparities is part of my research. And then the last one is helping the commission improve their race and ethnicity data. Um, it turns out that even at its core concept, people have misunderstandings about what race and ethnicity are and how they are not mutually exclusive. And so it's a little bit complicated when it comes to doing research because, you know, in order to build models and predict things, we do have to put people into various bins. And so uh, the commission has recently um, realized that their, their race and ethnicity data are not as complete or as accurate as, as they need to be. And so it's uh, sort of been an undertaking of mine to figure out how we can fix that retrospectively with the data that are already collected by the commission and then also prospectively moving forward. How can we make fields easier to understand? How can we train staff and what have you so that, so that it's more accurate moving forward? So that is all I will say about me. Sorry for speaking for so long. <laughs> That was great. Yeah, no, thank you. You're doing, you're pretty busy over there as well. Um, so I think now we're going to move over to Jermaine. And Hello, everybody. You yourself? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jermaine Archer, most, I think you did, thanks for the introduction. You did a great introduction. I appreciate it. One thing I would correct, I don't normally correct people, but Claire, we met before that class. We met at the I know, debate. I know, but it was such a good story. Yeah, it was. It was great, but I felt like the debate story is better because that's the first time I saw you and we just connected, we clicked. And when you came back in to teach the class, I felt like I knew you already. So it was a lot more easier. You know, taking classes in prison is not necessarily easy. A lot of us feel like we may not measure up. They may think we're stupid, but you did such a great job in letting everybody know we all coming in here on equal terms. So I appreciate that. You know, from the it was really from the debate. And even though Ice-T was the star of that show, I remember meeting you and Lila, and I always remember that's where we actually met. So I really appreciate that. We became fast friends. Like, like the introduction said, I'm from Brooklyn. I was in the streets. I was living that life, as the young people like to say. I was a nickel and dime. I was a hustler. However, I got incarcerated for a murder that not only I didn't commit, but the police officers knew I didn't commit it. And they made it clear that either I was going to tell them who committed it, or I was going to do the time. Of course, being young and not knowing better, I thought if I didn't do it, they can't send me to prison. But they did send me to prison for 22 years. And I met a lot of interesting folks along the way with documentary evidence to show they really didn't commit the crime. Fast forward 20 years later, we realized that was a habit of the Kings County District Attorney, the New York County District Attorney. So many convictions have been overturned in the past 15 to 20 years based on prosecutorial misconduct that it was just the norm. They didn't matter. A crime committed, this guy's not a good guy. Let's just take him off the street, solve the crime, and we'll kill two birds with one stone. And I've met a lot of people. Fortunately, I did the bulk of my time in Sing Sing, and that's one of probably the most progressive prison this side of San Quentin. And they offer music, they offer theater, they offer college, they offer epidemiology, parenting courses, and many of us availed ourselves of all those opportunities. We took advantage of every program. I knew when I came home, I didn't want to work in epidemiology, but I still took all the classes on HIV and AIDS and hepatitis C. 
to increase my toolkit when I come home to make sure I have as many options as possible. I worked in a law library for 20 years and I got tired of the law library fighting cases, fighting for people's innocence, fighting for people's visitation rights. And I, I, it just frustrated me so much that I promised everyone I'm done with the law. I, I understand the injustice, but I fought, I put in my time. I'm not going home to work for a law firm. I'm not going to law school. If you catch me working in a law firm after I get out, that means all my other plans failed. Five weeks after I got out of prison, I was working at a law firm. That's how it happened. I didn't even apply for the job. I just felt like, you know what, maybe this is divine intervention. I'm, I'm halfway decent at it. Uh, someone called my parole officer and said they had a job for me. It was actually a judge. And he said, tell Jermaine Archer to call this number. I have a job for him at a law firm, which worked out great, not only for the job, but me and my parole officer have been great friends ever since, knowing that I work at a law firm and knowing that I have a judge that has my back. So it made my interaction with parole so much smoother. They lifted my restrictions. I didn't have a curfew. I didn't have geographical restrictions. But I, I will just say something, there's no data on this, but I know four people that were incarcerated for murders they didn't commit. And I know this because we know who did it, just like everybody know who did it in my case. We know who did it. And ironically or coincidentally, all of us got 22 years to life. So we were thinking, is there something to do with that number in New York State? You know, well, how do we all get 22 years of life? And we all know we didn't commit it. And we actually know who committed each other's crimes. But of course, being in the life, we're not going to snitch. We're not going to tell. So we fell on our swords and we did it. So that's one thing I want to point out. The other thing is, obviously, all of us came from black or brown communities. We were poor, we were disadvantaged, and most of us had public defenders. It feels weird saying that now because I work for a public defense organization, but I, I understand the challenges that they face. When we say race matters, it's not only a matter of police interaction, it's not only a matter of what the judges see, but it's also a matter of funding when it comes to your defense. You know, if a, if a public defender has 40 cases and, and, and you know, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes to review each case before they go to court, you're not going to get quality representation. And I'm learning this from being in there. And that impacted my decision. I take the LSAT in June. I decided, OK, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to become a lawyer because I feel like I can directly connect with people from similar backgrounds. I can I. Right now I work as a credible messenger slash sentence mitigation paralegal. So I have to find any program that can mitigate sentences for our clients. I also chaperone young people. I hang out with them. They, 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 they connect with me. I'm able to get through to them and get them to do the things they need to do to improve their life. So I work with the youth shelter of Westchester. I work with SNUG, which stands for should never use guns. I work with SUV, which is standing up against violence and I feel like my passion is young people. My passion has always been with the young people. And I, I'm older than I look, but I don't feel it. And I always feel like I still got that swag. I could go stand on a corner and talk to them. And by the time I connect with them and relate with them, then I could take them where I want to go. When I was young, I led a lot of people down the wrong path. And I feel like they're going to follow me anyway. So why not lead them down the right path? And I take the LSAT in June. Like I said, I said, oh, one last thing. I survived COVID twice in prison. The first time I got COVID, I contacted CNN. They made a, no, I contacted NBC. They made a big story on it. And I became public enemy number one to the administrators because according to them, I made the prison look bad. I was scared for my life. We didn't know what was going on inside. So I did a news article, they published it. And then it, it created a firestorm around the country. And my name kept coming up with COVID in prison. So they threatened me. They told me all the nice things they're going to do to me when it dies down, you know, they're going to, physically assault me, they're going to put me in solitary confinement, they're going to do all this and that. But eventually, cooler heads prevailed, and they just kicked me out of the jail. They gave me a mock parole hearing. They didn't ask me any tough questions. And my counselor told me they were tired of me. They just want, because I had become an advocate, criminal justice reform. I would sue them. I would write a complaint. I, I learned the right way to fight. I used to try to fight with my hands. And I learned later on, the pen is mightier than the sword. I worked in a law library. I kept them in the news mostly for good things, for the programs I was affiliated with, but sometimes I would let them know, I'm not your house Negro. You know, when you violate, I'm going to make it clear because sunlight is the best disinfectant, like the Supreme Court judge said back in the 70s. So I'm going to let everybody know what you're doing in here. So eventually they got tired of me and they just sent me to another prison. They gave me parole, kicked me out of the prison, and I contracted COVID again. 
And that time I was a little scared because I was in the box. They put me in solitary confinement and I've never experienced those symptoms before. And the last thing I wanted was to die in prison after being in prison for 22 years for something I didn't do. Fortunately, people got involved, prisoners, legal services, a couple of lawyers, my family, secretary of state, a lot of people, my wife, they put so much pressure on the prison that they took me out of solitary confinement, put me back in general population, and I survived and I got out and I guess the rest is history. That's such an amazing story. Mr. Archer, do you mind speaking a little bit more about how you became empowered to fight in the way that you did? I have no problem speaking about that. The, within 90 days, I was, in, I was in the solitary confinement. Within 90 days of being incarcerated in state prison, I was in the box, as we call it, for assault on staff. And, you know, they jumped me. It was three people. I had a big mouth. I'll admit that. You know, I was little. I was very small, but I had a big mouth. And they beat me up and they threw me in a box and they charged me with assaulting three officers, all of whom weighed over 200 pounds. I might have weighed 160 pounds with a couple of batteries and some coins in my pocket, but they, they took care of me and then charged me for the assault. I got to Clinton, which is near the Canadian border, and a similar situation. And I will admit, I threw the first punch in that fight because I knew what was going to happen. I had been through it before. So I said, at least I'm going to get something before they beat me up. And they beat me up again. And they put me back in the box and something just told me like, okay, one, I'm going to have to explain this when I go to the parole board in 19 years. And two, my body is not built to really absorb this type of punishment on a regular basis. So first I gained a lot of weight. I was over 200 pounds, but then I started thinking, I took a couple of programs. The best thing that happened was they sent me to the annex, Clinton annex, and it's much more programmatic. It's much more therapeutic. They had HIV and AIDS program. They had vocational programs. So I started just saying, let me just spend my time as productively as possible. Let me not waste my time playing dominoes. Let me not waste my time talking. And let me just start doing things because all this time count. And the more programs I took, even though I was faking it to make it, I was taking programs just to make it look good on my resume, something clicked inside of me. And there was a time I remember when a guy stepped on my sneaker and I said, I'm gonna let him get away with that because I don't wanna get in trouble. And a few years later, another guy stepped on my sneaker and I was like, he don't even know what he's doing, you know? And that's when I realized I had really changed. I don't need to let him get away with anything. And once I got into the law library, I started realizing the power of law. And I realized, you know, ink is the most powerful weapon in the world, publication. So working in the law library, learning about the grievance mechanism, learning about how laws are made, learning about how I can actually have an impact on that, even from inside, because they have to publicize or publish every law before it takes effect and our families can offer their opinion on it. So I made it, I started studying more about law. I took Blackstone, became a paralegal. I started interacting with a lot of civilian volunteers, community volunteers. And as my status somewhat grew, because I started becoming a model prisoner, a model inmate, as I like to call me, I realized my voice carried more power. So if I said something to the superintendent, he would take it a lot more serious than from the average person in there. And there were more than just me. I'm not a special, like there was at least 15 to 20 of us in each prison that decided to really educate ourselves. And I'm not gonna fight with these anymore. I'm gonna fight with these and I'm not gonna lie. That's what I always told the superintendent when I got them in trouble. Tell me what I lied about. If everything I said in there is true, then you need to talk to your staff because I don't lie on staff. I don't do that because I know if they start lying on me, I'm gonna lose. So I can always tell an officer that I wrote a complaint against Everything I said was true. So you can't get mad at me. And as we went along, I became affiliated with Osborne, Hudson Link, Rehabilitation Through the Arts, and all of these things just instilled or reinforced that transformation where I realized these don't really work. I don't need these anymore. And I, I joined the Alternative to Violence Program, which is Nonviolent Conflict Resolution. Most people thought it was just to make parole, but I would explain to a lot of young people my progression, my path, and show them, you see how the superintendent come in here and talk to me? He could talk to you like that too. You got to educate yourself. You got to equip yourself. Don't think because you're a gangster and you know how to fight, you're not going to beat them. If they come in, if you can beat 20 of them, they're going to come with 21. So you need to start educating yourself and understand that this is a system. And once I realized the significance of the system, not only the racial impact, but the class impact, I realized I have to be public enemy number one. And, and it hurt my family when I did the article for NBC because I was going to the parole board in a couple of months and they were concerned how it may impact my parole decision because they all won. 
And I, I explained to my wife and she understood it. She knew who she married, but I said, look, at that time, I'm the only person left in here with that voice. Most of my peers had gone home. They were all released. We all had over 20 years in prison and she didn't want me to jeopardize. But when I explained it to her and let her know, look, people's lives are at risk. Whatever happens is going to happen. I'm not going to be the only person in here with some type of power to make change and just keep quiet. So when I, I and I had NBC on my phone list, like I can call CNN, I can call NBC. I said, no one else in here has that. So she said, look, I'm with you. Whatever you do, I'm by your side. And I called them. And really, that's when I realized the power I had, because I was doing it just as a last resort. I didn't know what else to do. But it really got the commissioner under the spotlight, the, 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 the warden or the superintendent under the spotlight. And I used that as another example, as a teaching moment for all of my peers I was leaving behind. Like, look, you need to really educate yourself, learn how to write. They don't want to fight with people that know how to write. And also being and doing. I changed my whole life. I stopped doing all the illegal things. Be where you're supposed to be, do what you're supposed to be doing, and they can't get you. I don't care how great of a writer you are. If you're still breaking rules, they're going to get you. And they're going to put you in a box and they're going to ship you out. I had to clean up completely to the point where I stopped selling drugs. I stopped fighting with people. I stopped everything. And I became that my... I, my favorite line for people going to the parole board was be the person you want them to think you are. And I became that person, not intentionally at first. It took years and years and I made a few mistakes along the way. But by 2007, 2008, I was on the right path and I knew true sustainable change is irreversible. I got arrested not too long after Princess Diana passed away. So this is how I use my, um, my bookends. Princess Diana passed away and then COVID, all of that time in between, I was incarcerated for a crime I didn't commit. And I made the best of it. And I hope I left a good example. And so many people that are left behind did say they appreciate it because they saw the change. It's easy for a guy who wasn't, or a girl who wasn't in that life to go in there and be a model prisoner, a model inmate, a model incarcerated person. It's more impactful when they can say, I remember him. He was in the streets, he was selling drugs, he was running around with weapons and look at him now. If he could do it, I could do it. And that's what I felt like. I, I hope I left that lasting impact on the people I left behind. And I hope that answers your question because I know sometimes I tend to ramble. You're muted. That was I awesome. Think. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Thank I talk to myself even though I'm muted sometimes. I don't know if y'all do that too. Um, so, I, I mean, fantastic story and it's completely admirable what you chose to do with your time. Your reflection and your TED talk on time and uh, it, while you were incarcerated was really, um, was it was meaningful, it was motivating. Um, so, so you're working with public defenders right now. And yes. Dr. Strange, you uh, are working on sentencing initiatives and Dr. Tasha Rafi challenged us um, to uh, to watch the documentary 13. So kind of maybe putting some of these things together along with a Q&A comment from Alan. Uh, so that documentary that you had us watch, Dr. Tasha Rafi, it very clearly painted a picture that the whole uh, hard on crime, political rhetoric uh, and, and policies like three strikes you're out and mandated minimum, um, uh, mandated um, sentencing minimums, uh, that they have racial overtones, that law and order um, is a dog whistle, at least to a certain extent, uh, for race historically and presently. So uh, perhaps to a certain extent, uh, when current candidates say that I'm the law and order candidate, that also may have some racial overtones. So it's hard not to think about all of that uh, in the context of the hearings for <laughs> Judge Katinje uh, Brown Jackson uh, that are happening right now and where she's being accused of coddling criminals and being soft on crime. She also was a public defender for a while. And she, as Alan pointed out, she, she worked on the federal commission uh, for, for sentencing. Um, so it doesn't seem irrelevant that given that history, uh, both her own personal history and the history of the way that we talk about crime in our nation, it doesn't seem irrelevant that she's black. So I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Tasha Rafi, Dr. Strange, Mr. Archer, do y'all have a perspective on how those conversations about crime are playing out in her hearings currently? I do, but I'll defer because I just finished speaking. <laughs> so I'll listen to what they say. And if I have anything to add, I will. Honestly, uh, 
Dr. Tasha Rafi, I'd like to hear your response because we spoke about this and I liked what you said. Hey everyone, I wanted to, to, uh, to thank you for you guys for having me and uh, Dr. Dinatu and Dr. Carol. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join you guys uh, having conversation with Dr. Strange and uh, Mr. Archer and uh, our great Hikari and Catawba County community. Uh, so uh, first, Dr. Nietzsche, I want to clarify one thing you asked me earlier. So I think the relationship with, with the, the uh, common thing between my, my work, working with youth, uh, criminal justice system, or juvenile justice system, and my soccer thing is just my passion to work with youth. But I, I just said that is not related because uh, the kids that I work with in soccer are not justice involved kids. I think the question of calling uh, offenders or uh, being tough on crime or being soft on crime has always been a, in a popular a conversation between uh, uh, liberals and conservatives. Uh, we have seen this over and over uh, being repeated uh, in the history that you know, uh, a group of people basically uh, asking for more harsh, harsher punishments uh, compared to other people asking for more uh, uh, more treatment programs. So this is this is not something new, and uh, does not really uh, does not really surprise me. Uh, I think uh, the, the major question that should be asked is what what is the ultimate goal? What what are we trying to do? I think the criminal justice system has always been uh, serious with serious offenders. Uh, maybe this is not the the perception of the public, but the criminal justice system has always been uh, serious with serious uh, uh, crimes and uh, offenders. I think the uh, question here is that what is the ultimate goal? Are we trying to uh, incapacitate someone for 30, 40 years, right? Uh, just uh, to protect the public or are we opening door for treatment and looking into the causes of the problem to prevent that for the future? I think that would be my, my short version of uh, short uh, answer. So I'm gonna let others jump in if they would like to. Um. So regarding her, uh, you know, being a, a nominee and having sat on the Federal Sentencing Commission, I think it's important to remember that for judges anywhere, you know, sentencing guidelines are a product of a time, of a um, sort of ethos, you know, they're a product of, of what people fear or, or, you know, the popular approaches to punishment, like uh, Dr. Tasha Rafi said. So, do, you know, does the public value retribution? Do they value incapacitation? Do they value rehabilitation? And so um, judges are having to meet sentences um, within, at least judges with um, sentencing guideline states or under the federal system, you know, they're sort of confined to give um, certain sentences or at least recommended to do so. And it's, it's uh, very, very common that uh, judges might think on the whole that sentencing guidelines are just perhaps a little too punitive. And again, that's, that's probably a product of, um, you know, sentencing commissions being related to or having members that are political or politically involved, feeling pressure from the public to sort of create them that way. Um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, I've been unable to listen to um, the session so far, and I'm so disappointed in myself for that. Everybody's been texting me about talking about <laughs> sentencing guidelines, um, but I'm going to make sure to go back and, and listen to some of the highlights. But, but I know that they've been uh, giving her sort of a hard time, especially with sentencing sexual offenders and things of that nature. And, um, you know, I think people just don't realize a lot of things about different types of crimes. For example, uh, you know, people who commit sexual crimes are among some of the lowest in terms of recidivism. Um, and, and, you know, when you give harsh sentences for those types of crimes, it's more often sort of a public uh, judgment on, you know, of morality, so to speak. So, um, and there's also, of course, for any sentence, for any individual, uh, mitigating or aggregating factors that judges are allowed and should consider, you know, there's to think that we can give an appropriate sentence just knowing someone's crime, it, to me, is an un inaccurate um, position, or perhaps a position that I don't take, maybe is a better way to say that, Um so I'm thrilled to have someone nominated who has the experience of being a part of a commission and understanding all the nuances that go into creating and implementing that policy. 
Um, but with that said, I'd pass it off to you, Mr. Archer, if you have anything to add, please do. You know, I'm a radical at heart. So um, I love her. I love the experience she brings. And most people that know me know I'm not gonna vote for you just cause you black or just cause you're a woman. I know there are some qualified, there are a lot of qualified black women, there are a lot of qualified black men, there are a lot of qualified non-dominant society people out there who can fill these roles. I don't believe in just putting people in a role based on, I don't wanna call it affirmative action, but just based on skin color. I would particularly am not a fan of the vice president because I know what she did when she was in LA. So I didn't just, I voted for Obama because I believed in Obama. And I didn't, when I say I voted for him, I mean, I voted through my family. I made sure everyone voted for him. I don't believe in, because I know Sheriff Clark as well. And Sheriff Clark does not have my best interests at heart, neither does Clarence Thomas. So all skin folk are not my kin folk. And I understand that. But I do believe that she has the right experience and the right balance. There are many sex offenders, Republicans to call them out. Uh, we have the, the, Christopher Ortloff, who was a parole commissioner in New York State, and he was very tough on sex offenders. You could not get out of prison if you had a sex offense. And I'm not sure of the year, but he got out in 2019. He served about 10 years for lining up sex with 11 and 12 year old girls. He got arrested. This is a New York State parole commissioner. There was the guy with the wide stance from Ohio, you know, and he was very tough on same sex marriage, but yet he was busted trying to procure same sex in the airport. So I understand that a lot of these things are self-hate and they hate themselves because they feel a certain way or I don't know, they hate us, but I do believe that we need the right people and I believe she's one of the right people. Or the guy that drank beer, I hate to say it, I can't think of his name now because I blocked some people out, but he was a Supreme Court nomination and he said, I like beer. He was clearly unqualified in my estimation, but they pushed him through. We have politicians that give people pardons when they're clearly guilty. Trump, Bush, we have a bunch of them, even, even Democrats. So I don't believe, I believe she's being given a raw deal because sex offenders in nature in general, there's different classifications. If someone literally did something to a child, in my estimation, I believe that's worse than someone watching a video of it. Now, the person is watching a video of it, it's a problem and they should be dealt with, but I don't think they should get the same punishment there's backgrounds there's you know there's societal issues there's so many things at play where you can't just say i'm going to throw the book at every sex offender and like claire said certain offenses have a lower likelihood of rehabilitation and i i just love the fact that she's up there and it looks like she's going to get it and i appreciate it because like i said i was not really a big fan of the vice president and i'm going to support her because she's our vice president but I just like to make my position clear. I judge people on their background, on what you've done and what you said, as opposed to your skin color or your societal background. Oh, and one last thing I like to say in terms of race, I'm sorry, the shoe bomber. I'm hoping all of us are old enough to remember the shoe bomber. Remember the shoe bomber on the plane? He was taking off his shoe and he was trying to blow up a plane. He got less time than I got. Just, just, just pointing that out. You know, people that was, you know, terrorist act. He got less time in prison than I got. So when we start talking about race, we can talk about certain crimes and factors and realize, yes, people in the ghetto, they give them football numbers, we like to call it, 25, 30, 50 years. And then people outside or people from different backgrounds, they get what is termed a fair trial and due process of law. And I'm not saying they shouldn't get it. I'm saying we should all get it. Not to mention, he's the reason that we all have to take our shoes off at the airport from now into eternity. <laughs> Absolutely. Richard Reed. Really good. Absolutely. Really good point. Yeah. And it, also worth pointing out when we're talking about uh, crimes in sexuality, it, it obviously doesn't matter whether uh, it's same sex or opposite sex. Um, doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, and so uh, speaking of discretion, right? So like these, these sentencing guidelines, and this is kind of the world that you're, you're involved in, uh, Dr. Strange, you, you mentioned that you think it's uh, a good a good thing for for judges to have discretion. Um, although, as Mr. Archer is making very clear, like the discretion uh, also involves a really wide range that may be applied differently across different judges. And so, I'm wondering, how do you reconcile those two things of having room for judicial discretion in sentencing while avoiding 
either unfairness across jurisdictions or even bias, as the article that Dr. Tasharafi had us read, uh, bias shows up in sentencing. So how do you how do you square that circle? Uh, you might, you don't, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's complicated, I guess, is, is my answer. So, you know, there are many different types of sentencing guidelines, I should say. So, you know, some are voluntary where judges are given, you know, they're sort of told by a, a sentencing commission, this is the research that we've done. And we've found that people who commit this type of crime and receive this type of sentence tend to recidivate at this rate, you know, something evidence-based. And then, uh, you know, if the guidelines are voluntary, then then they can choose to sentence within that range or not. And there's no consequence to that. Um, and then you can also have presumptive guidelines where they are expected to, at the very least, justify um, an upward or a downward departure. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, in sort of complicating guidelines, you may have statutory mandatory minimums, as you said, where judges do not have control over what happens. And so I think um, discretion is important, but you also have to remember that everybody's discretion is different and is informed by different experiences and beliefs. So um, a fair sentence to one person may not be a fair sentence to another. And so I guess the question sort of becomes, how do you rein that in? How do you, you know, keep this certain judge from this county from giving 40 years for something that shouldn't even have a quarter of that? Uh, you know, sentences that aren't even informed by any type of evidence or seemingly merited whatsoever. So, um, you know, I think I, I'm just speaking from experience from Pennsylvania, but uh, you know, their, their guidelines are voluntary and they give a standard range and then they give an aggravated range and a mitigated range. So, you know, a range that's a little bit longer and a range that's a little bit shorter and all of those are considered within the guidelines. So that's not a departure. And so you're, it gives judges, I guess, the ability to consider um, certain things like, uh, you know, whether criminal history suggests that people will continue committing the same type of crime over, over and over or, um, I, you know, I don't know, desire for rehabilitation and, and things of that nature. So um, there, I don't have a good answer to this question, <laughs> but I love, I love sort of my, that my job is to think about it because it's so very interesting, but I think, I think it's structured discretion where judges have sensible um, posts that they can look at for certain crimes and certain individuals to uh, at least be able to balance, you know, this concern about public safety with concerns for rehabilitation and uh, reducing disparities, you know, so um, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Strange. I think that was that was um, a great response and kind of connects to a question that we have somewhat in the Q&A, not so much about the sentencing um, guidelines, but more about back to kind of what's happening in the prisons and um, retaliation that occurs when you try to advocate for yourself. And so Pastor Paul wants to talk a little bit about just the racial makeup of prison guards. He says, can we name the racial makeup of prison guards and, and how does that or doesn't that affect the retaliation that occurs in uh, prison? Uh, I'll tell it does it does affect me. And I will tell you, Retaliation occurs from all denominations. It's not just the white folks that are way upstate. I, the first time I was assaulted, I was assaulted in Sing Sing by three Latin officers, and one of them was my complexion. So it's it's not a matter of race when it comes to who gets assaulted when you're down in the city, Green Haven, Sing Sing. There are certain prisons that are predominantly staffed by people of color, black and brown people, Asians sometimes but they have a gang mentality. So I don't know if I felt safer in Sing Sing or Clinton. Now I know in Clinton, they're gonna really try to hurt me. They're like that's the difference in Clinton, they're gonna try to hurt me. They're gonna try to kick my teeth out. They're gonna try to damage between my legs. Like they have certain things they go for in Clinton when they hurt you. You could tell when someone was jumped by an officer in Clinton or Attica, cause usually they're missing some teeth or they got some permanent damage down there. Sing Sing is more like a gang mentality. They beat you up. They kick you, they stomp you, but they're not trying to kill you. It's just a matter of sending a message. The worst 
prison I was in, in terms of racial makeup, was Green Correctional Facility. It's a medium. They killed someone there a few years ago, and Cardi B, the rapper, was protesting out front. And it was chaos, but the racism is not even hidden. They have nooses tattooed on their arms. They wear short sleeve shirts. And they will let you know that we will bury you here. We will kill you. When Trump law, when, when they called the election for Biden, I was there and it was terrible. They shut down programs. They wouldn't let us go to do the normal things we do. You can't go to the yard. You can't go to work. It was their unofficial protest. But between election day and the day they called it, it was so much tension. The racial makeup of most prisons is predominantly of European descent, predominantly white people. You have Collins, Sing Sing, Green Haven. Those are predominantly people of color. You have Fishkill, which is probably about 55, 45, any given day. But at the further you go upstate, the more it is white people that run the prisons. And those are Trump supporters. Those are conservative Republicans. Those are people who have made a living off of prison. So in their mind, this is a job. This is my livelihood. They don't believe in rehabilitation. They don't believe in any of that. They have to dehumanize us in order to do their job efficiently as they've been taught to do it. I had a great conversation before I came home with a self-described hillbilly. And he told me he never met a black person he liked because they always got big gold chains and they got three baby mothers. And we got to really talking and we, his name was Matt. We really got to know each other. And one day out of the blue, he just told me, man, it's, I can't figure it out, man. I don't know what I don't like about you, but you just giving me trouble because I've never met a black person I like. He was honest, I appreciate it, well bigger than me, but the racism was inherent. It was systemic in the community he came from. And we would, you know, we would just talk logically. And I kind of felt like it was Project X. Uh, well, not Project X. What's that movie? American History X, where I run into a skinhead, a real racist, and I'm kind of changing his views. And, you know, I, I, of course, I wanted to go home, but I wish I had a little bit more time with him because I felt like I was making an impact. But we really became good friends. And he would lend me his tablet to watch movies. I would lend him mine. And his friends would make fun of him because they were still racist. But he would come over to my bed every night. It was open. It was a dorm. And, and he was cool with the officers because when you're up there, there's two different types of white when you're in prison. You got, you know, John Gotti white, which is like city white, and then you got up north white. So if you're not up north white, you don't get the good jobs. You, you're treated just a little bit better than the blacks, the Asians, and the Latins. So he was up north white. So he could walk around and do anything he wanted. He wanted to cook with me. We started, we really became good friends, but he we had conversations about officers and he would explain that's just the way we were raised. You know, I don't even know why I think what I think, but someone told me it and that's it. And I left him with something to think about. But back to the question, the racial makeup is really predominantly based on the geogra geography of the, of the prison. And those that are closest, Collins and, and, and Wyoming, they have black people because they're near Buffalo and they're near Rochester. And there are a lot of black people that take the test. Sing Sing, of course, is 45 minutes away from the city. Fish kill because people transfer from Sing Sing and even downstate. But as you get to Midwest New York and upper New York, far, far uh, north, then it's going to be majority white conservative Republicans and Elmira. All those prisons have been sued for affirmative action or for racial uh, inequities. And they don't care at the end of the day. They let you know this is our prison. You know, we're going to run this prison the way we want. And that's the only reason why anyone, I was in Clinton. No one can escape from Clinton. I thought about it. I was in Clinton Correctional Facility. I was trying to find a way out. I wanted to make an early withdrawal. I wanted to get out of there if I could. I realized I couldn't. Two white guys escaped from Clinton because they were the only people that were given those jobs. And that was based off of the staff, based off of the CEO. So they would only take care of their own. And that's the only reason why they got the embarrassment and the public shame, because only up north white people could get those jobs, not Italians or Irish people from the city, they were even racist towards them to a certain extent. You're a city white boy. You're not one of us. You're not a good old boy. So that impacted safety of this of the prison because two convicted murderers escaped from a prison that I could have never escaped from because I would have never got those tools or that job to get out. So all that's impacted by racism as well. I'll just say that um you know, thank you for sharing that and, and just your detail. Um, 
there is a, a, a comment, I guess, in the Q&A. And the comment is just, we have a student who would just like to know if you would be able, Mr. Archer, to just be a speaker in this class every session. Do you think that would be possible? <laughs> <laughs> when is every, how, how often is every <laughs> yeah. I take the LSAT in June. But I mean, I'll be available. <laughs> Whenever I'm available, I'll, I'm certainly, I love it. I mean, <laughs> especially if they're under 30. I love talking to young people. I just, it makes, it keeps me young. So absolutely. The only thing I would say is I take the LSAT in June. So come May, I'm going to really be buckling down because, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of people way smarter than me that get paid a lot of money to try to fool me on these tests. So it's going to take me some real study in to not get fooled on every question. As someone who's been friends with Jermaine since 2013, I can say every second that you get with him, you have to cherish because this is a man who is in high demand, uh, <laughs> but always wonderful to hear from, as you all have found out. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Thank you. I try to make every second of my life count. I'm enjoying this. This is time well spent. Thank you, because I, as you know, I'm passionate about my time. So if I get into a place and I feel like that was a waste of an hour, I'm not even going to sleep good tonight. So I appreciate that. This is meaningful. Seriously. Well, I would love to kind of take the conversation in a slightly different direction and talk about um, just, you know, what leads to criminal activity. And um, particularly, I'm just going to draw a little bit from one of the um, articles that we had to read for this week, um, the Elliott article. And um, pretty much in that article, the author asserts that informer, informal social control decreases chances of criminal activity. And it seems that informal social control is defined as, you know, special programs, being able to you know, be involved in sports and reading programs and just, you know, things in, in the environment that kind of keep you out of trouble. And so to me, it sounded like the authors were, were trying to say that um, maybe child rearing, rearing in the community um, significantly impacts one's um, likelihood of getting involved in criminal activity. So what's happening in the community, what's happening in the family, et cetera. And so there's programs that have been pointed out in the article, you know, I see the African American Families Program, there's different programs that are meant to kind of help people help young people stay out of the streets. But then when you read when you look at that 13 documentary and you and you hear about um, ALEC, A-L-E-C, the ones that kind of write these laws and legislation that get, you know, put up for passing that have these mandatory minimums and, and all these other things. I just wonder, can, you know, can child rearing and informal social control really help, you know, our young people stay out of the, the system or are they kind of doomed just based on the laws that are on the books and the structures that kind of are pointing them to prison? Hope that was clear. <laughs> yeah, I think the difference between the formal and informal uh, social control can be explained mm -hmm. as so formal social control, when we talk about formal social control, we're talking about any sort of intervention uh, initiated by the criminal justice system, whereas when we're talking about informal social control, we're talking about anything that it doesn't really have much to do with the system or formal intervention of the system. So if you think about it, uh, the difference between the kids who have uh, been raised and grown up in a, in a uh, working class family compared to the, uh, to the kids who grown up in a, in a middle class family, right? So when you think about the working class family, what kind of uh, uh, opportunities are available to those kids? Uh, so are we providing equal opportunities that we are expecting equal outcomes, right? So if you provide equal opportunities, every child has equal opportunities, then it would be acceptable to have, to expect equal outcomes, right? So uh, when you grow up in a middle-class family, how your time is structured, right? So first of all, growing up in a family that your parents keep asking you questions that kind of develop your critical thinking skills. It helps you with problem solving the skills. Uh, you are uh, spending your time from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. going to swimming pool, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, going to the tennis classes, right? So your time is structured. You are spending your time with probably with pro social groups. Whereas if you are talking about comparing that with a working class family, right? Uh, maybe larger families are spending a vast majority of their time in the community uh, with other kids that might not be entirely pro social. 
So these are the differences that it makes, right? So uh, if you're talking about defining the police or if you're talking about other, uh, other um, aspect of in, uh, investing resources, what really matters is not defining the police and taking the resources off the police, right? The, the whole idea is that how can we actually use, that, uh, use those resources to the best interest of the community? by providing uh, opportunities for the kids that are at risk. I think Mr. Archer kind of, uh, I was looking at his bio, he does kind of work with youth who uh, their parents have been incarcerated. So that's a great start, right? So you are identified, so it's a known risk factor for youth whose parents being incarcerated. So providing opportunities to those kids so they do not follow the, the same pathway uh, and uh, basically la uh, kind of filling up the gap of not having parental model uh, in your life, it would be a huge, huge step. But what we do is currently focusing on, and it's getting much better compared to 10 years ago, but what we currently focusing on is letting that in initiation uh, happen, right? So letting that contact initiate with the system, and then we want to start working on solving the problem that could have been resolved much, much earlier. So I think uh, just my, my, uh, my idea always about uh, how to handle a crime problem or, or after, uh, uh, issues relating to delinquency uh, is to uh, start early, right? Very early in life, uh, investing the resources on disadvantaged communities and basically trying to, uh, to prevent what appears to be very predictable. Uh, given the circumstances of the of the family and and the, and the neighborhood, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, the defund the police movement because uh, with our last few minutes here, I'd love to get y'all's take on this. So, like the violent crime is on the rise, a 30% increase from 2019 to today, and there are a lot of people who are pointing to. Um, the reason for this uptake is because of movements like defund the police that have uh, undermined the power of um, policing. Uh, what do you think about drawing that connection? And what do you think about um, reallocating funds from police, uh, from, from traditional policing to other programs? I think that uh, the rise in the in the crime is a little bit more complex than what we 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 know uh, or what we might think. First of all, we are seeing a significant shift from uh, uh, official data moving from the uh, traditional UCR data to neighbors, uh, which is uh, with the official source uh, reported to the, to the FBI. Uh, the the problem with the traditional UCR is that it had this what is referred to as a hierarchy rule, that uh, when a crime happens, only the most serious crime was being recorded. Now we are moving, starting 2020, we are moving to neighbors, which kind of, uh, kind of overcome that limitation. So all the crimes that happen in one incident, because the incident space is, uh, is being recorded. So that's going to have some impact on the way that we see the, and we see the, we see the result uh, of uh, rising crime, for example. Uh, but the, the fact is that the crime has been declining uh, qu quite remarkably since early 1990s. And uh, the rise that we are seeing right now uh, over the past two years, which is uh, serious due to uh, perhaps pandemic, a much more complex uh, uh, um, uh, dynamics that we might think, uh, it might be related to uh, all the social factors and everything that's going on during the pandemic and not necessarily uh, due to the meaningful rise. So it, I think it's very, it's, it's a, still a little bit early to conclude that crime is in rise because we saw similar fluctuation in the, the early 2000, 2004, 2005, I believe that kind of uh, got back to the, to, the, to the opposite trend. So I know we're kind of running out of time. We're going to stop here. Very quick. One, I agree with everything you said. Those numbers are, uh, Warren Buffett told me when he came to Sing Sing, don't believe any statistics unless you fudge them yourself. Those numbers are fudged because we've all been locked in for, for, over, for over two years. So crime has been abnormally low. Secondly, when the police say they can't do their job because they're going, they refuse to do their job because someone was caught on tape killing a man in slow motion who wasn't resisting, and you feel like that's a threat to the police, then we don't need them anyway. Now, I'm not with defunding the police. I know we need the police. I got a lot of people in my family that I want to make sure they're safe. 
But if you feel like you can't do your job unless you can kill people with a knee on their neck for almost nine minutes, and if you get penalized for that, then you can't do your job, then you need another job anyway. That's what all I'll say. I like that you're pointing out that it's a bit of a false dichotomy uh, to say uh, you, you can't have us if we are held accountable. Of course, we can both have you and hold you accountable. That's really nice. Uh, and I think a great way for us to end today. Shoot, Dr. Carroll, it's happened to us here again uh, at the end of this hour. I want to keep talking. Um, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, next week we, we're going to get to have yet another excellent conversation. Uh, Dr. Ryan Lurz uh, is going to be reflecting on representation and appropriation in the arts. He's going to explore the role of music and protest. This is a class that he teaches here at LR, uh, a class I've heard really great things about from his students of music and protest. Um, so we get to explore race and racism through the lens of the arts. Um, really excited for next week. And of course, as always, the recording of tonight's session will be posted on Canvas and on YouTube tomorrow. Please do feel free to continue the conversation in the comments there. Thank you so much, Dr. Strange, yes, Dr. Tasha Rafi, Mr. Archer. I cut you off, Dr. Carroll. <laughs> You're going to say thank you too. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank them for me. So yeah, thank you, this was <laughs> thank a great you for having us. It's a really Absolutely. wonderful conversation. Y'all have sure. a good evening. Okay. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.